This is the Deseret News, Sunday edition, when your family needs to know more. Good morning and welcome to the Deseret News Sunday edition. I'm Dave McCann. This program will highlight six areas of editorial emphasis, faith, family, excellence in education, values in media and culture, causes related to helping the poor and financial responsibility. And we do hope you'll enjoy it. This morning we're examining the state of the American family. In recent years, the standard for forming a family has taken a dramatic shift. The Deseret News is featuring a special report on the fragile family this month. Here's a look. There are really two Americas in terms of families today. The educated and uneducated. Research shows college educated families for the most part. What'd you do at school today? Follow a fairly yeah. traditional track. Crew sleeps down here and Tara over here. The unions formed by parents without college degrees living in fragile economic situations are often brittle and brief. It's a shifting landscape, unlike we've seen before. Marjorie Cortez and Lois Collins explore this shift in depth for the Deseret News. Since 1960, the number of children living with two married parents has decreased dramatically. In 2010, only 66 percent of kids in the U.S. lived this way, compared to 88 percent four decades ago. We have a lot of families that have what I refer to as pseudo-parents, sliding door parents where uh, mom may be married multiple times. How much do you want? That is how 25-year-old Jordan Ott grew up. He recently married I don't know where it is. and hopes his it's new family something. life turns out much differently than his parents' lives. From them, he learned... Stuff that I've learned not to do. That one's so cute. He plans to offer his children what he didn't have growing up, stability and emotional support. So what I mean, you can really just to you. make sure that I'm making the right decisions to take care of my family, future and present. Complex family situations create many challenges for children. They want to belong to a family, and I, and I think they want to be in a family where they have an appropriate role as a child, where they, where they don't have to act as a parent because mom's a drug-addicted person or dad's absent. I was raised by my grandmother. Nowhere is the lack of stability or the failure of parents more evident than in the American child welfare system. My whole life, there's been plans, but I plan to graduate not in foster care. And didn't happen that way. At 17, Arby Brugo is a veteran of change, disappointment, and loss. His family has always been broken, and he's struggled with temper, depression, and truancy. I just want to take whatever life gives me and make the best of it. Resilience is another topic Collins and Cortez explore in their series. What people need most is hope. That comes in a lot of different ways. So how do you create that hope? How do you strengthen the fragile family? Yeah. One of the things that we're trying to look at is what the different sides say, keeping in mind that most families are not going to be perfect, but that there are certain things that are kind of even best practice for parents, for families, and there are always things you can do to strengthen the position and help your kids. Scholars agree stability is essential for families to thrive and that two-parent families are generally more stable. Not always, but generally. Now here's a look at the different living arrangements children were living in 2010 compared to 1970. You can see there's been a significant rise in households with single mothers, but an even more alarming is the increase in children living with no parents at all. KSL's Deanie Wimmer is here with a closer look at these trends. Thanks, Dave. Brad Wilcox is the director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia. Thank you for joining us today and to talk more about this. Tell us first off, what is the National Marriage Project? Uh, the National Marriage Project is a research uh, arm of the University of Virginia that's designed to basically track the health of marriage in America, but also to identify strategies to strengthen marriage in the United States. Many of the headlines and the, the news stories that you see and hear um, portray marriage in decline, marriage in a negative light. And yet one of the headlines I read that you wrote for an article talks about marriage isn't dead yet. What is some of your research? Well, I think there are a couple of, um, you know, actually some bright lights to, uh, to highlight um, in thinking about marriage in America today. Uh, one thing is that uh, marital quality has stabilized, um, that basically folks who are getting married today who are married today um, you know, we're not seeing a major decline in their marital happiness. Uh, a second thing to, uh, to note is that 
Um, the dramatic increases that we've seen in non-marital childbearing uh, since the 1970s have leveled off. Um, since the Great Recession, we're sort of stuck at 41% here. Um, and another thing that's worth, I think, noting is that divorce um, has come down in recent years, um, particularly for couples who are marrying for the first time and having kids thereafter. So kind of, you know, if you're thinking about getting married and having kids today, your odds of getting divorced um, are lower than they would have been back in the 1970s and 80s at the height of the divorce revolution. And it looked like from the from the research that I saw in your article that those numbers had stabilized. I mean, we're not seeing an, an increase or a spike, but they stabilized in several of those areas. That's right. I mean, I think we may have plateaued, if you will. We've kind of we may have leveled off in um, the dramatic changes that we've seen in American family life um, since the 1970s. Um, so, um, you know, I think that's basically good news, given that most of those trends have moved. Um, in a negative direction since the 1970s. Fair to say, though, that the American family faces challenges in this day and age? It is fair to say that, but I think we have to sort of qualify that by saying that among college-educated Americans, what we're seeing basically is that um, the vast majority of adults are getting married, the vast majority of their kids are, you know, coming in marriage, and the vast majority of those marriages are going the distance. They're not getting divorced. Uh, where the movement, um, unfortunately, in marriage in America today has been is among working class and poor Americans, where we've seen market increases in divorce, in non-marital childbearing, in family instability, in single parenthood. So it's a kind of a, a two nations uh, pattern we're seeing, where some Americans are doing well um, in the marriage department and other Americans aren't doing so well. What specifically is happening within the working class family that that uh, ev evolves into those problems? Well, you know, what's interesting here is that sort of among the poor families, we saw major increases in single parenthood and divorce, non-marital childbearing in the 70s. And that same pattern has now sort of come up the social ladder um, in the last uh, two decades or so. And I think what's been happening is that, uh, number one, working class men are having more difficulty finding um, good jobs to pay good wages and give them stability and security. And because marriage is still in part about money, um, that makes them less attractive as potential husbands and also adds strains to their families once they do go ahead and get married. So that's part of the story. Uh, I think another part of the story is that we've seen a dramatic retreat from institutions like the church, for instance, among working class Americans uh, since the 1980s. And because churches provide um, a lot of um, support uh, for marriage in one way or another. The fact that working class Americans are less connected to churches today um, is another factor driving all this. And then just more broadly, there's been a shift in American life towards a kind of more individualistic, a kind of me first mentality, um, and also kind of live for the moment mentality. Um, and this sort of short um, sighted approach to life, um, or this sort of me first mentality, um, you know, is not conducive to establishing and sustaining a strong marriage and family life. So as you talk about things like church, things about like community service, civic organizations, I would imagine fit in that same category, things that would bring people together and provide you that support network, that's what is often lacking because of what you're calling this me first. Right, so it's both a kind of a civic and a cultural um, change that we're seeing in, in many parts of the United States. Um, that basically leaves people um, less connected to core community institutions and then, of course, less able to handle the, you know, the challenges that, that marriage and parenthood bring to most, most Americans. Give, well, let's talk about children for a minute. What, in what ways are, is society changing that is detrimental to children? Well, you know, I think if you've spent time with kids, if you have kids, if you know kids, um, you know that kids thrive on stable routines with stable caregivers. Um, and you know, typically, uh, married couples have provided that stability to their kids. Um, and so when divorce comes on the scene, um, when people are cohabiting and then breaking up, um, the problem for kids is they're, they're experiencing major instability. Um, and that's a threat to them emotionally and socially, um, and then also often financially. Um, and that's why we see basically the kids who are raised outside of an intact married home are more likely to suffer um, emotionally, socially, and financially compared to their peers who are raised by their own married parents. Aside from the trends that you're seeing in your research, how is marriage genu generally uh, viewed among Americans? 
Well, it's important for us to realize that there still is a kind of universal regard for marriage. Most Americans, regardless of their their, their wealth, whether they're rich, middle class or poor, whether they're black, white or Hispanic, most Americans aspire to marriage, aspire to a, to a strong and happy family life. Um, and that sort of that ideal um, hasn't disappeared. Um, but I think what we have seen is that sort of the economic foundations of marriage for working class and poor Americans particularly, and the cultural commitment to virtues um, like sacrifice and um, you know, uh, lifelong commitment, um, flexibility, forgiveness has, in some important respect, um, waned in America. And so that's why we're seeing um, a greater fragility in American families today than we would have seen 50 years ago. Brad, just, we just have a few seconds left, and I just want to ask you, you, you referred to the fragile family. What can society do to build up and strengthen the fragile family? Well, I think that we need to work on uh, strengthening the economic foundations of working class and poor families. We need to uh, make some cultural changes that stress the value of commitment and of marriage itself. And also we need to encourage both religious and secular institutions in America to, work, to reach out um, and um, bring in working class and poor Americans into uh, their activities and their organizations. All right, Brad Wilcox, we appreciate you sharing your research and your insights with us today. Very helpful. Dave, back to you. Thanks, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Dini. Up next, the president of the Interfaith Alliance in Washington, D.C., and how our politicians have hurt the most vulnerable of Americans during the government shutdown. And a closer look into the national debate over fetal pain and how it's reshaping America's abortion laws. This is the Deseret News Sunday edition on KSL. Welcome back. In the midst of a federal government shutdown, religious leaders are speaking out in a variety of different ways about the United States government and the after effects of the shutdown. The Senate chaplain has been scolding lawmakers daily during prayer meetings. The chairman of three committees of U.S. bishops wrote a joint letter to Congress. And the president of the Interfaith Alliance says religious leaders are uniting over the shutdown out of disgust. Reverend Welton Gaddy now on how Congress is mishandling its business. I'm Welton Gaddy, president of Interfaith Alliance. Our organization works uh, to look at religious freedom and to protect religious freedom for all Americans. Why are we concerned about the shutdown of the federal government? Because we're good citizens of the nation, for one thing, and because we have a moral conscience uh, for another. The shutdown is discouraging people's views of democracy. And this nation is founded on democracy. Our work in religious liberty is closely tied to nurturing a healthy democracy. In this situation, the people who are most hurt in a time of shutdown are the weakest and poorest among us, those most vulnerable, those for whom another hurt may just tip the scales in the wrong way for the rest of their lives. We're interested in seeing the government practice the compromise that is essential to democracy. But to do that without compromising the moral integrity of democracy and of both the Democratic and the Republican Party, which means not only providing justice, but providing food and providing housing and taking care of the public welfare. We have to end this right now. Reverend Gaddy with his viewpoint. We also cut up with the pastor of the largest church in America. Here's what Joel Olstein had to say about the shutdown. You know, I think like everybody, I'm not thrilled with it, but I'm not, you know, here to pass judgment on anybody. I, I just want, like I think most Americans, uh, everything to be back open and back to normal and so I know they're good people on both sides so I'm just praying that it'll all work out. You can read what other religious leaders are saying about the shutdown on DeseretNews.com. 
Over the summer, Texas passed a controversial abortion statute that bans abortion after 20 weeks. Behind that law is a scientific dispute about the development of the human fetus. Some argue that the fetus perceives pain as early as 20 weeks, while others choose a much later point. Eric Schultzke writes for the Deseret News, has been covering this development, and we welcome you to the program. Thanks. Is this the start of something really big in the Roe v. Wade debate? It's transformative. Uh, it changes the, ga the, the ball game. Ever since 1972, uh, the debate has centered on viability, which in 1972 was 28 weeks. Right. That's since evolved to about 24 weeks, uh, which is where the law stands now. But the uh, fetal pain debate shoves it back to 20 weeks with, with the potential to go further. And the debate is at 20 weeks, according to the research of many, the fetus is experiencing pain and that should spare it from an abortion. Yeah, it's a, it's a disputed issue. A lot of it hinges on wiring. Uh, there's disputes over how soon the wiring uh, connects between the thalamus and the cortex. And even outside of the wiring debate, there's disputes over whether or not in order to feel pain, you actually have to have human experience and perceptions that require uh, kind of awareness outside the womb. And so it, it gets into almost philosophical debates at times, but there is very solid reason to believe that, uh, that a fetus inside the womb reacts uh, biometrically mm -hmm. and that also uh, that if a fetus is anesthetized during surgery in the womb, uh, the mortality rates go way down. And these are various markers they look at to say that pain is actually taking place. Well, speaking of the wiring, Maureen Kondek at the University mm -hmm. of Utah, a neurobiologist there, has done a lot of study. And this is what she has to say. She says, quote, this is not so much a medical ambiguity as it is an opportunity for us to consider what kind of society we want to be. And I think there's sufficient uncertainty to warrant giving the fetus the benefit of the doubt. What's she talking about? Well, uh, she's actually getting at the idea that the uncertainty, you know, the tie goes to the runner. And the, the uncertainty is, is there. Now, a lot of people try to say there's no uncertainty. And, yeah. and really what my research is, is meant to highlight is the fact that there are some very solid scientific reasons to believe that, uh, that there is sufficient uncertainty to, uh, um, to put it in play. And her argument is, if it's in play, then we have to err on the side of the fetus. In your research, you went to California, visit with a family where twins were born at 26 weeks. What did you learn? Well, I, I use that as more kind of an illustration because uh, it, it takes you back to a point not very long ago, as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, uh, most doctors thought that a newborn infant felt no pain. Right. And they did not anesthetize newborn infants when they were given common procedures. So both of these preemies were born at 26 weeks and both of them underwent major surgeries. They were anesthetized. But I was able to talk to the mom and the father and get a sense for the kinds of things that they saw that reflected pain, even though they were having anesthesia, and, uh, and kind of get a sense for what it would have been like previously. The reason that's significant is because a 26 week infant, according to many of the people who dismissed the fetal pain argument, is still not feeling pain, either from a wiring or from an awareness standpoint. Does this take the uh, debate uh, from the moral battleground to the scientific, where science actually supports those who've been fighting the moral cause against abortion for so many years? Yeah, I, I think that it, uh, it opens it up so that the science can inform the morality in a way that it hasn't been. Now, it's, the pain is not alone in this. We've also, we also have significant advances in our ability to perform surgeries in the womb. And the two of those together kind of make people see the humanity of the fetus differently than they did when it was a black box not very long ago. What do you think is going to happen over the next couple of years? Well, uh, within the next two years, the Supreme Court is going to decide this. And uh, which means Anthony Kennedy will decide it. And uh, Justice it, Kennedy. it will be a 5 4, almost certainly a 5 4, one way or the other. And I think there's a very good odds that Kennedy comes down on the side of the fetal pain advocates. Two years also swings it right back into the election cycle. Will abortion be the key debate again as we head that way? Uh, I, I don't know on this one. I, I don't know. I, I suppose there's always, there's always fertile ground to uh, mobilize. Uh, the left uh, on the on the uh, war on women, like was done in the last election cycle. So, potentially, yes. All right, Eric. Thank you very much. Read more of your work at DeseretNews.com. Very interesting topic. One that is not going to go away. Thank you. Coming up next, Lynn Sanity returns to Utah. Hear why the director believes the mainstream media ignored the film's message about faith. This is the Deseret News Sunday edition on KSL.
Welcome back. Eight months after the Sundance Film Festival, the faith-filled documentary Lynn Sanity is finally arriving in theaters. It's open nationally in seven major media markets. The documentary captures NBA player Jeremy Lynn's big rise on the basketball court. But as Deseret News writer Jamie Gazi Askar explains, the movie has much more to do with faith than it does sports. I felt like I was being controlled by something else. I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. I still have to pinch myself to really believe it. Christianity is an underlying part of this film, but a lot of the mainstream media either totally ignores that or, or just doesn't know how to handle it. Nobody thought he could play. I had the opportunity to speak with the director. Jeremy Lin came from nothing to greatness. He mentioned to me that uh, he thought that the reason the film wasn't getting so much the, the, the reason the Christian angle of the film wasn't getting so much traction was because people don't know how to really approach the issue of an athlete who is devoutly Christian. For example, Tim Tebow um, is, is devoutly Christian and becomes a caricature. He puts the order of God first, family second, basketball third. It's more of God is in all those things. He was standing at the door and he had tears in his eyes because the pressure was really getting to him. And I remember he turned to me and he says, I don't know if I can keep doing this. If Jeremy had been like Buddhist or um, uh, like Scientology, something like that, that it, the media, he thought the media would have felt safe kind of addressing that. But um, because it's Christianity, he felt that the media was just really shying away from that. Puts it up! Bang! Jeremy Lin from downtown! The fun thing about Jeremy Lin's faith is that it really colors every aspect of his life. And he's picked up by the Rockets. And then when he was cut by the rockets. I give it a really high recommendation. It's going to make you feel good about um, that sometimes the people who work really hard and do what they're supposed to, that, that they come out on top. And another security guard came over and like whispered like, oh, I think he plays on the team. Looks very interesting. Lynn Sanity and the Houston Rockets play at the Jazz on November 2nd here in Salt Lake City. That's our report this week on Deseret News Sunday Edition. You can find more on the stories we covered today on DeseretNews.com. I'm Dave McCann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Music and the Spoken Word is coming up next on KSL. It's really just seeing Fatima take the plunge and take this Asian American player. If I don't get drafted here, I probably won't get drafted. Landry Fields. He puts the order of God first, family second, basketball third. It's more of God is in all those things. He was standing at the door and he had tears in his eyes. Lynn all the time. You look at yourself more when you lose. Lynn has a chance to make history.